Well, did you know fathers are like parking spaces? The good ones are already taken. And uh, see, I guess Lori left the room, so I, I was afraid the rest of us men would have, have mascara running down our cheeks too. But uh, you know, watch out for that. You know, my dad is the, the man in my life who I always looked up to even after I got taller than him. I always looked up to him. Today we're going to look at a story about a father who we can all look up to. And you may think that my Bible may be stuck open in Luke chapter 15. And uh, I don't know, it may be. And uh, Les, if you can get our PowerPoint going there for us, that would, uh, that would help me. There we go. Continuing this series into uh, Luke chapter 15 and beyond. Go ahead and go to the next slide there. Today we're going to read a story about a party. And it was a surprise party. And it was a surprise in a number of different ways, and we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. But today's story begins with the word, meanwhile. I don't know, know about you. Where, where did we get this? I, I always think, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Does anybody else? I don't know where we got that. But that's exactly what was going on in this story. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Remember, this was a sheep and a goat ranch. Where this story took place. And uh, we're going to read a story that we can very much relate to in South Texas. And I'm going to tell you my version of it in a minute. But if you would look at uh, Luke chapter 15, go ahead, Les, and put that next slide up on the screen. We have it printed for you uh, who can read that smaller print that far away. And if you cannot, you can look in Luke chapter 15 in your own Bibles and uh, read along this story with us. So let's do that. Let's read the story first, and then we'll talk about it. And it does. It begins with this word. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then the story gets complicated. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. He made a scene. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, has come home. You kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours, he was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he is found. Great story. Great picture of a great dad here on Father's Day. But let's, I hate it when I read the Bible and I leave the stories stuck in the Bible. And they don't make it all the way to me. And so let's, let's think of this story as if it happened in a South Texas, our time kind of setting. You know, the older son is out in the field. What a responsible kid. He's working in the field. But here's, I think, the first hint he got that there was a party going on. I think he smelled mesquite smoke. I mean, what better stewardship of the fatted calf than something that starts with a mesquite fire? Does anybody else in the room agree with me? They were having a barbecue. And so they had the fire going. I think he probably smelled it. And as he made his way toward the house, then he started hearing it. And it was loud. Okay, in our context, mariachi. I think he heard the music. And he's going, what in the world is going on? And you know, it, it, was, it was so loud. You know, the text says it. It uses this word. He had to call. He had to call out to one of his father's servants. Hey, come here. Tell me what's going on. I smell smoke. I hear the music, what in the world is happening? And then that's when he got word. And I think he was not just surprised. 
I think he was shocked. What? We're having a party for who? And here's another thing. It says, it was not only loud music, and it says it right there in the text. He could even hear the dancing. Does that sound like South Texas? <laughs> and, you know, he, three of those reasons are really why I don't care too much for parties. Now, the first one I go for. You know, the barbecue deal, I'm up for that. But it's, it's loud. Yeah, my hearing aid amplifies everything that I don't want to hear. And I'm trying to have a conversation with somebody. All I'm hearing is all the background stuff going on. And so I guess it's because of the loud. And dancing, you know, I'm the one, give me credit, for the answer to the question, can Baptists dance? The answer is not well. <laughs> I get credit for that. But they had this party going on. But let's make the contrast, okay? And uh, I, you, I sometimes like to walk back and forth. And so this side's going to be the elder brother's side. And this side, I'm going to walk back and forth to draw a contrast between these two, these two men. The younger brother. This is the younger brother's side. I've written some notes on my hand. Okay, the younger brother was a waster. Remember that word prodigal? means wasteful. He was a waste, waster. Now the older brother, he was caught in this story, wasn't he? Working. He was a working brother. All right, the older brother, he was the rule keeper. He treated his dad like the rule giver, didn't he? The younger brother, on the other hand, what was he like? He broke all the rules. He was the rule breaker. He was rowdy. You know, the party fit him. His other brother was responsible. And draw, draw the contrast with me. The older brother stayed home, right here where he's supposed to be all those years. The younger brother strayed far away. Now, I don't know about you, but that reminds me of a lot of families that I know. The two kids will grow up in the same home and will end up in such stark contrast. That is the way these two kids were. Huge contrast. In fact, I came up with a picture that I thought, for me, illustrated it. Go ahead, Les, to that next picture. That kind of pegs it, doesn't it? Yeah. The older brother would have been the one that all of us are so very proud of. You know, his picture probably ends up in the newspaper every once in a while. And he's the one that when, when our friends think of their kids, we, we hope they're thinking of him. And just think of it. Again, in our context. So the story won't stay stuck in the Bible. Let's think about it. The older brother, the Eagle Scout, he would have been the first one Mary Jane's taking care of kids right now, working in the field. <laughs> he would have been the first one to sign up for VBS. Responsible, hard worker, conscientious. He would have been the one that on Thursday afternoon, well, actually Thursday morning into the afternoon, was here mowing the lawn so that the rest of us, when we showed up on Sunday, everything would look manicured. He's the one who would have been so responsible as to fill the baptism tank up here with water so that this morning when the rest of us got here it would be done. He would be the one who would show up on Monday morning and count the offering and accountability and take it to the bank. Uh, he would have been the one when the pipe breaks, he comes down here and fixes the pipe. We're surrounded by responsible people like, like the older brother. The ones without whom this church, we, we wouldn't even have the lights on this morning. We're indebted to the older brothers in this room. You know, some of those other brothers even grow up and try to preach. I mean, they're so older brothers. And, and we all benefit from the older brothers who are, who are in this room. Thank all of you. You know, the Sunday school teachers, the youth leaders. On and on and on we could go, the older brothers. So the list is good. When you go down the list of all the things that that older brother does, man, check them off. They're all good. Until you get down there close to the bottom. And then we been, begin to see not just the outward appearances like in that picture right there, but we begin to see what's on his heart. And verse 28 is where we first got the, the, got the first clue. 
when he heard about the party, he got mad. The older brother, who was so responsible and he contributed to the family, while the other would just consume the family, but he got angry. And then he was self-righteous. He pointed his spotlight, look at all the good stuff I've done for you all these years. He, he, he may have even, you know, it takes me a while to process some things, so I didn't mention the Orlando thing last Sunday, although I was already aware of it. But I'm afraid that the older brother may have had this response to the Orlando thing. You know what? They got what they deserve. If they hadn't been there in the first place, it would have never happened. God save us from that kind of judgmental attitude. The older brother. John MacArthur warned us about the older brother, a bit of whom lives in each of us, resides in each of us. For all of us, the elder brother's attitude is a powerful warning showing how easily and how subtly unbelief, unbelief can masquerade as faithfulness. It was about 1982, and I was at a uh, BSM, Baptist Student Ministry, gathering meeting at Park City's Baptist Church in Dallas. I was there with all my students. As a leader, I was a director of a Baptist Student Ministry. I was there with my groups, and there was a man who stood up to preach. His name is Bill Hendricks. Some of you may remember him, William Hendricks. He was a seminary professor at three of our seminaries. He was brilliant. He was academic, and he was big-hearted. And uh, he stood up to preach, and he started from this same familiar passage, the prodigal son's story. And he started up there in the beginning, and man, I was going along with everything he said, and I was thinking, yeah, I'm like the younger brother. You know, I strayed, and, but I came back. I'm like the younger brother. But he didn't stop there. He kept on going, and he got to the elder brother, and as he worked on the passage... The passage worked on me. And then I realized, I'm just like the elder brother. It was a huge surprise to me. It was as big a surprise to me in that setting as this party was to the elder brother. It really surprised me. And I remember how convicted I was of my elder brother tendencies too. Yeah, on the outside, I, I literally, I'm an Eagle Scout. I did that stuff. But then, man, if you start looking beyond the surface, you could see the attitudes that Jesus really needed to work on in my life. You know, the self-righteousness, just like this elder brother. And so, that's why this story, I call it a surprise party. It, it was a story for, it was a surprise for everybody here. The, older, the younger son, think about it. He was surprised his dad was going to have a party for him. Because remember, he came home saying, hey, I'm no longer be worthy to be called your son. Uh, just give me a job and I'll work for you. And his daddy wouldn't have any surprise. We're going to have a party. And the elder son who's faithfully working out in the field, a party for him? And they killed the fatty calf. I've had my eye on that fatty calf for a long time, but this is not what I had in mind for him. But then, the one who was surprised most of all, was the father heartbroken and surprised, knowing that his son wouldn't come in. You see, in their day and time, the elder son would have been expected to help host the party. And where is him? He's balking. He's out in the yard, maybe to the front porch, refusing to come in. He's like, remember that? We talked about that last week. The cow balked before the trailer. Won't come in. Dug in. No, no not going to come. And his, heart, and his father was surprised, and his father was heartbroken. Rick Warren said this, when rewards are given in heaven, the most surprised will be the elder brothers. See, he was, he was disputing why there would even be a party going on. It was a surprise for him. That we would not be surprised. At God's grand treatment, it those around us who maybe we look down on them and think, man, I mow the yard and count the money and lead a Sunday school class and volunteered for vac vacation Bible school. And what about the guy who won't do any of that stuff? Oh, that we wouldn't 
stay there. John Piper, when he, you know, worked on this, this text, and I benefited from his work, he talked about the tender word that Jesus had in this setting for the Pharisees. Remember, the whole context, if you'll go out back in verse 1 and 2, the whole context is there's a large group of people here listening to Jesus talk, and uh, the sinners and tax collectors is what they're called. We're sitting on the front row, eating up every word Jesus had to say. But then the ones with the seminary degrees, the leaders, you know, the Pharisees, they were all sitting in the back complaining that Jesus was keeping company with those kinds of people. Remember, that's the context that prompted these stories that Jesus told. And so it was really, it was a tender word for the ones who were in the back complaining. And he was... Man, Jesus wanted to bring them up to the front row too. He knew they were being left out by their being judgmental and by their being arrogant and by their thinking that they had earned such favor from God and none of these people down front had earned that. And that's where they were stuck. They, they were stuck out on the front porch. They were stuck in the yard. And so Jesus and these stories is pleading for them tenderly. Now, contrast that. How many times did Jesus talk about the Pharisees when it was in really harsh terms? Lots. Like virtually all of the rest. And I looked up a few of those this week. And there's a whole long list of them. And, uh, well, I thought I wrote that reference down. Just thought of it this morning. Yeah, in Matthew 15... You know, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Who were the subject? Of, who was the subject of the woe? To the Pharisees. He called them a brood of vipers. He called their mouths open graves. You know what an open grave smells like? Yeah. Usually it was the harsh word that Jesus had for the Pharisees, who were, you know, the ones with their arms crossed, angry all the time. And he was trying to bring them in. And these are the tender words that uh, that uh, Jesus had for them. So it's actually five of them, if you look at it. And you can look in the text and follow along with me there. First of all, remember the father who waited for the younger son? He went out to pursue. He moves toward him. The son that's balked in the front yard on the front porch. He moves toward him. And then he entreats him. That's a biblical word. Our word for that, he begs him. Please, please come into the party. And then his father, his son who had characterized him even as a slave driver. I have toiled for you all these years. What did his father call him? My child. He sonned to him. And then the father says this, you've always been with me. He was just so shocked. W what's going on here? As in, implying, I've always been with you. Why the balk? And then he says this, everything I have is yours. It's all yours. Including the part, this party is yours. The party's for you too. So I, I picture the father so surprised and so disappointed at the older son who, by appearances, has done everything right. He's done so many good things. Thankful for him, for his contribution. But then when it came time to celebrate, stayed out on the porch. Wouldn't even come in the house. So he broke it. So Jesus is making this tender appeal. And I, I do remember when uh, I was hearing this preached for the first time. I, w I wish I could do so the way I've heard it. I, r I really do. But it just got to me so much. And I was so surprised by and then honestly humiliated that I hadn't seen that side of me until William Hendricks worked through this parable with us. I realized how much that I needed uh, to repent of. And so, come in.
from the foreign country of misery. You know, the young brother went to a foreign country, literally. The older brother stayed home in a foreign country of misery. Absolutely miserable. And he thought that he would have earned his father's favor by his great performance. But his father didn't have a party for him, you know. And then this, this younger brother who'd squandered so much, he has the party. So his father's on his knees, and he's pleading for him. He's pleading for him. And this was the appeal. Come be a part. Don't separate yourself. Come be a part. Come to the party. You know, there, there are people inside. They see you as they're on. And you're hurting them when you're not here by staying outside. You know what? It was actually probably kind of scandalous. I think it took the damper. How many of you have been to a party and everything's going on good, but there's this backstory that everybody's aware of, and although the music's going on and the food is good, the small conversation's taking place at the tables. Well, you know, but he's not here. And there's this damper put on the whole deal because of the one who wouldn't come. And that's what the older brother was doing. He's putting a damper on the whole thing. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be the damper putter on her. And I want to be able to celebrate. When I see somebody who's coming forward and saying, you know what, I have squandered so much, but God is so good to me. Man, I want to be the first one to celebrate. Instead of saying, yeah, but you got there by your own bad actions, you know, and not to be judgmental over there looking down at other people. I don't want to be. I pray that God will rescue me. I pray that he will rescue us. So when folks come into this room and they're thinking of all the bad things they've done and all the squandering they may have done and all the offenses they may have committed and they're they're frightened that they walk through those back doors afraid that we would just judge them, I hope this is what they get. Welcome to the party. We are so glad you're here. And those of us who have performed well, you know what? We don't deserve anything any of it. I have another slide. Is it on there? You know, the slide of the yellow pad? There, here's, a, here's a list of all the things that you and I are entitled to. For all of the good stuff, there, there's the whole list. That's what we deserve. That's the reward that we have worked for. No, but it's the Father who says, everything I have is yours. And that's based on grace, not based on performance, not based on mowing yards and fixing broken pipes and teaching Sunday school classes and trying to preach. Grace, all grace, all grace.